Paul, the valiant soldier for Christ and tireless missionary, finally arrived in Rome, a prisoner in chains delivered to his fate. Surely there would be a big finish to such an illustrious career. But no, the final chapter of Acts of the Apostles fizzles out, with its hero living in his own rented house, a Roman guard for company, and receiving all that came to him. Two whole years passed, and the Apostle preached the kingdom of God and the Lord Jesus without hindrance. End of. Such an ending, while sufficient for the first edition of the story, clearly left later Christians frustrated. When and how had Paul died? Surely it was as a martyr. Had he not indicated in his letter to the Romans a desire to visit Spain? From that it was reasoned, by tradition of course, that Paul had been released from his house arrest and made another missionary journey, not just to Spain but also to Crete and elsewhere. The apostle was then re-arrested, returned to Rome, imprisoned a second time and then executed by Nero after the Great Fire. This ridiculous itinerary made it possible for Paul to be associated with the first persecution of the church, and for newly written pastoral epistles to be presented as authentic. Pious romances, scribbled between the 2nd and 4th centuries, provided additional fabulous nonsense, including Paul's beheading on the very same day as Peter. Of course, nothing in secular history confirms the fate of St Paul, but then nothing in secular history confirms that he even existed. Even without the accretions of legend and Christian imagination, Paul's sojourn in Rome is a fabricated deceit. During the hazardous and fantastical voyage to Rome, an angel appeared to the apostle and repeated the words of Jesus, Paul must appear before Caesar. The apostle supposedly was shipwrecked on the way to Rome and had waited some three months before his onward passage to Italy. So until the ship actually landed on the Italian coast, no one in Rome would have had any idea when or even if the renowned evangelist would arrive, and that assumes the evangelist was renowned. Once Paul had made landfall in Italy, how would Christians in Rome, supposing for the moment they even existed, actually have known that Paul had arrived? Word, of course, somehow had to go ahead. He's coming, he's coming. But that's when problems with the wondrous towel really mount up. The author of Acts writes that brethren in the port of Putoli pleaded with Paul and his party to stay with them a week. The remarkably accommodating centurion Julius escorting Paul seems not to have raised any objection. Was the Roman really so relaxed about another unwarranted delay? They had, after all, just spent three months on the island of Melitit. The centurion's obligation was to deliver his prisoners to the authorities in Rome, and his pay would have been well in arrears. And how on earth did Paul and his companions find brethren in the town of Putoli? Outside of the Christian dreamscape, were Christians really so numerous and so easily identified? The nearby city of Pompeii shows absolutely no evidence of first century Christianity and no church in Putoli is attested before the 5th century. How likely was it that the brethren of Putoli would or could offer a week's accommodation not just to Paul, but also to the centurion Julius in whose custody Paul was being held, plus certain other prisoners, plus Paul's companion Aristarchus, and the we author of Acts. The author of Acts, in fact, had a good reason for holding Paul in Putoli, 
He wanted his hero of the faith to enter Rome in style and to applause the Pauline equivalent of the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Yet Putoli was 170 miles from the capital. News of Paul's approach had to reach the city well before Paul arrived. How else could the brethren of Rome have come out to meet him? Travellers on foot, going north from the port, could hope to reach the coastal town of Tarasina after four or five days, where they would have had a choice between a canal boat or a 19-mile section of the Appian Way that was subject to flooding. The canal drained the road and was fed by the Canata River just beyond the river harbour at Forum Appi. Making the rest of the journey on foot, news of Paul would have taken at least a week to reach Rome. Even if a horse rider had been dispatched almost immediately from Putoli to carry the good news post-haste to the capital, three days would have passed before his arrival. The logistics of Paul's meet and greet are really very problematic. The journey from Rome to Appi Forum was 55 miles, at least two days travel and most probably four. Are we really to believe that Paul enjoyed such a towering reputation among brethren in the capital that excitement and anticipation impelled them to make such a journey? What did they know of the man? Supposedly he had just passed an uneventful two years in jail in Caesarea. With another two days or more to make the return trip, would slaves and freemen, the natural clientele for primitive Christianity, really have gotten several days' leave to go off to meet and greet an enigmatic holy man? Weren't there lots of those in Rome already? Even supposing these first Christians in Rome were independent Jewish artisans, tent makers perhaps, would they really have had the time to spare? Time would have been required for a group to be organised or individual brethren to be informed, and after all, Paul was imminently arriving in Rome anyway. No wonder the author of Acts had the Christian grandee tarry seven days at Putoli. Several days at the very least were required for an adoring audience to be assembled. Elated brethren making the journey south from Rome to greet Paul at the 55th milestone was a scenario born from theological purpose, not historical reality. The imaginary scene sketched by the author of Acts, of respectful believers determined at all costs to identify with the apostle on the road and accompany him on a triumphal entry into the capital of the world, was for the edification and delight of later generations. What, after all, had Paul done for the Christians of Rome? Sent them a letter several years earlier? With the undeniable fact that persons unknown had established the church in Rome, what was there really to make the man from Tarsus such a star attraction? In reality, the admiring crowd was no more than a literary device to aggrandise the hero of Acts. Paul, we're told, was allowed to live in his own hired dwelling, an extraordinary indulgence of a prisoner, not Roman citizenship notwithstanding. Where did Paul's companion Aristarchus and the writer of Acts stay, one wonders? In a city crowded and short of housing for those who flock there from across the empire, how on earth did Paul, in chains, find a dwelling so quickly and pay the rent for the next two years? In fact, it soon becomes obvious that we are not speaking of a room in a grim tenement of the kind in which most of Rome's residents lived, because apparently Paul received into his house great numbers many of them pious Jews who would not happily enter cramped tenements notorious for transience, crime and immorality. Are we to imagine a modest villa, perhaps? And if so, how was that paid for? The antique Christian archaeologist William Ramsay, still much loved by the godly, though he did most of his work in the 1880s, was obliged to conclude, or rather speculate, that the meandering apostle supported himself from hereditary property. Now, one problem with Ramsey's guess of inherited wealth is how Paul was able to access that wealth. Did he wander the world with bags of gold stuffed in his breeches? 
Did he hold on to his money belt through beatings, imprisonments, shipwrecks and escapades in remote corners of the empire? The only rational explanation is that the entire story is a fabrication, which the further absurdities of the yarn prove to be the case. Not one, but two venues claim to be the site of Paul's two-year house arrest, but neither is located in the ancient Jewish area. San Paolo alla Aragola stands in what was once the theatre district, and Santa Maria in Via Lata is sited close to the Septa Julia originally a voting chamber, but used for gladiatorial fights and gymnastics in the imperial era. Santa Maria also claims that its crypt, in reality part of an ancient warehouse, was home to Peter, Luke and John, as well as Paul. After a short space of three days from his arrival in Rome, Paul had the effrontery to summon the Jewish leaders. And even more remarkable, three days later, they, the Jews, dutifully assembled before him. Who were the Jewish leaders that so readily accepted the summons from a renegade Jew from out of town? Now Rome had a sizeable Jewish population in the mid-first century. So how exactly did Paul contact the leading men? Would they have even heard of the man from Tarsus? As if that wasn't absurdity enough, the Jews then agreed to return to Paul's house for a whole day's lecture from the heretic. Yet if, in reality, the Christian sect were everywhere, would Jewish leaders really have remained ignorant of its claims? Had not the way not had an energetic presence in the city for some 20 years, would not the Jewish leadership years before have confronted the unknown proselytizers who had brought the Christian heresy to the city? The rabbis surely did not need a lecture from Paul. Paul's alleged encounter with the Jews of Rome is decidedly not kosher. But Acts assures us that such was the remarkable persuasive power of the apostle that after their one-day seminar, some of the Jewish leaders believed. Was the ancestral religion of the Jews so easily abandoned? Another claim that is preposterous. Interestingly enough, in enlightening the Jews, the apostle made no reference at all to a human Jesus, nor even referred to his own encounter with the risen Jesus on the road to Damascus. Instead, Paul expounded on the law of Moses and the prophets. His Jesus Christ came from revelation and scriptural reinterpretation. Having followed his usual performance of first lecturing the obdurate Jews on the meaning of their own scriptures and then issuing them with an ultimatum, Paul moved on to the more receptive Gentiles. His prisoner status made scant difference to what he might have achieved if he had not been a prisoner in the first place. Paul had claimed in his epistle to the Romans that his policy was not to work where the gospel had already been preached and it seemed that the faith of the Christians in Rome was so renowned that it was, according to Paul, proclaimed in all the world. This was even before wrote his epistle to them. The church in the capital had evidently existed for many years before he showed up in the city. Paul's original intent had been to pass through Rome, enjoy the community of saints for a while, and then travel on to Spain. But house arrest had allowed the author of Acts to change Paul's policy without losing face. The much-redacted Romans also has Paul write, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are all in Rome also. Paul, it seems, resumed his preaching mission in the capital and without hindrance continued to do so in the comfort of his own home for two full years. Paul had thus fulfilled the Lord's command to testify about me in Rome even if he hadn't fulfilled the angel of God's command to stand before Caesar. So what happened to Paul subsequent to his two years of home-based sermonising? History is silent, but holy liars are ever active. The intention expressed in Romans that Paul wanted to resume his missionary activity in Spain provided the basis for the assertion that the Spanish escapade did in fact happen. The document that confirmed this was another letter, forever known as 1 Clement, or more formally as 1st Epistle of Clement to the Corinthians, though in fact 
The letter is anonymous and Clement is nowhere mentioned. At either 13,000 or 16,000 words, depend on the choice of translation, the original Greek or later Latin, this preposterously lengthy letter, twice the size of Roman, stands service for many dubious claims of the church. With regard to the fate of Paul, the pertinent paragraph occurs in chapter 5. And here is the vaguest possible reference to Spain, the furthest bounds of the West, and the barest allusion to martyrdom. To make the death of martyrdom more evident, later copies of Clement read suffered martyrdom under the prefix, though even this makes no reference to when, where or how Paul died. But there are obvious problems for the theory that Paul evangelised in Spain. One of them is that the Spanish church gives the honour of founding apostle to James, the brother of John, not to Paul. Then again, there is no evidence of first century Christianity in Spain at all. Did Paul simply die of old age, perhaps? His struggle seems to have been against jealousy, not a vicious Roman emperor. There is nothing here about death in Rome, Nero or the burning of Christians. Interestingly enough, Eusebius, the 4th century church historian, made no reference to one Clement when establishing the supposed martyrdom of Paul, although he discusses this so-called epistle of Clement at great length. The first testimony that is quoted by Eusebius dates from more than a hundred years later than Clement, from a certain Caius. This Caius, possibly a presbyter in Rome during the papacy of Zephrinius, is reported to have written, but I can show you the trophies of the apostles, for if you will go to the Vatican or the Ostian way, you will find the trophies of those who laid the foundations of this church. Now, in the Roman world, of course, trophies went with triumphs, and we already have seen that Paul had a triumphant entry into Rome. Tropea, constructed by sectarians claiming to be persecuted, is extremely unlikely. Were the Christians not supposedly hiding in the catacombs in the time of Paul's death? Eusebius next cited Dionysus, a late 2nd century bishop of Corinth, who made the startling claim that Peter and Paul had talked and died together in Rome. Detail, of course, is missing, and the source is suspect. The so-called Bishop of Corinth claims that his own church had been planted by both Peter and Paul, a joint enterprise unknown either to Paul or the author of Acts. If that was the testimony of Dionysius, writing of his own church, his word is valueless for the Church of Rome. Eusebius throws in his own bit of questionable evidence at this point, reporting that the names of Peter and Paul were preserved in the cemeteries of that place even to the present day. But in the ancient world, the names of thousands of fabulous entities were preserved in burial grounds, public spaces and popular shrines. That made none of them real. The only reality is that now Peter and Paul had been planted in Rome. It should be noted most particularly that in substantiating the supposed persecution of Nero, Eusebius does not cite the notorious passage 1544 from the annals of Tacitus so beloved by today's apologists. This is especially telling because Eusebius, rather than cite the Roman historium, which he does nowhere in his history, chooses instead to recycle the vague assertions made by Tertullian, writing more than a century later than Tacitus, that Nero was the first persecutor of the church. Nearly two centuries after that alleged persecution, Tertullian urged his readers to examine your records without indicating the actual source. Now, Tertullian referred a second time to these public records, but this time he made clear his figurative use of the term. To quote, And if a heretic wishes his confidence to rest upon a public record, the archives of the empire will speak as would the stones of Jerusalem. Speaking archives have no more reality than speaking stones. It is more than a tad suspicious that neither Tertullian in the 3rd century nor Eusebius in the 4th century quote the historical records directly, which points towards the redaction of the text of Tacitus at a date even later than the time of Eusebius. Tertullian is most notable for his quip about throwing Christians to the lions, but he was also the first to say that Peter had been crucified. 
as he says, Peter suffered a passion like his lords. As for Paul, Tertullian reported that Paul was crowned with the death of John, that is, beheading like John the Baptist. Now, this already contradicts the boast ascribed to Ignatius more than a century earlier that that wannabe martyr wanted to be found in the footsteps of Paul, and yet at that time meant being fed to the beasts. In its wildest incarnation, Paul's later career is even more problematic and dynamic than the earlier career recorded in Acts. It is all based on a ludicrous overinterpretation of just a few verses from the fake pastoral epistles. Having made the claim that Paul travelled to Spain and the West, it seems the pastoral epistles suggest that Paul also travelled back to the East. Greece, it has been asserted, Paul took ship to Crete and then again returned to Ephesus where he wrote his letter to Titus. With the epistle of Titus moving Paul to Nicopolis, Paul's arrest and transport back to Rome is extracted from just a couple of verses of 2 Timothy where he says Luke alone was supposedly with Paul in his final days. Now all that is required is testimony that Paul died a martyr by decapitation. But Luke, the great historian, fails to say a word. So whether it was in Spain or somewhere else, Paul supposedly left Rome and returned to the city some years later. A chronology of this last period of Paul's life is even more problematic than earlier episodes, not least because all the claims are traditions woven around interpretations of epistles which themselves are inauthentic. Our only safe footstep is that if Paul existed, and if he was transported to Rome as claimed by Acts of the Apostles, his first detention lasted until the year 62. Did Paul perhaps return to Rome of his own volition, or was he still being hounded by dastardly Jews? Was there no second dramatic voyage to Rome invo involving, say, a shipwreck and a snakebite miracle or something similar, worthy of the great apostle? How long was Paul's second prison term? Was there a new charge against him, or was he simply caught up in the Neronian persecution, if such an event even occurred? Did he die in the year 64, or as late as the year 68? And why did Luke stop documenting his hero before these crucial episodes? According to the traditions about Luke himself, he lived to a ripe old age of 84. Is it remotely credible that the original Christians of Rome, who traipsed for days just to share with Paul his first entrance into the city, not only showed no interest in his second arrival just a few years later, but also failed to record a single word about his imprisonment, his trial, his execution and his burial? To all of these questions, we have only the imaginative answers from a later age. Papal ambition and pious credulity supplied what history failed to provide. Thus, a suitably grim prison was identified in which Peter and Paul must have spent their final days. With a few added artefacts, such as chains and graffiti, authenticity was confirmed and a tradition was born. Thus it was that the first and oldest prison in Rome was retroactively drawn into the Christian fable. Located on the eastern slope of the Capitoline Hill, close to the Forum, the lower subterranean level of the prison had originally been a water cistern. A spring rose through a hole in the floor and drained into the main sewer. During the Republican period, this chamber became a holding cell for state prisoners, many held penned in an inglorious display in a Roman triumph. Others simply died in this dark and damp dungeon, the only entry to which was a hole in the floor above. The prisoners, often naked, were lowered or thrown into this hellhole. Now, try to imagine this. Paul writing his second epistle to Timothy from the Tullianum. The Tullianum was integrated into the Christian dreamscape sometime between the 5th and 7th, 7th centuries, when it was added to the pilgrim trail and repurposed for Christian worship. By then it was known as the Mamertine. Even the spring itself was given a role in the faux drama. It owed its existence supposedly not to an ancient aquifer, but to a miracle of Peter, who used its waters to baptise other prisoners.
the healing waters would thereafter be a fillet to the burgeoning pilgrim trade. The holding cell at the Mamma time was not the only holding cell of the Apostle Paul. Six miles to the south at the Church of St Paul of the Three Fountains is another delight for the Christian pilgrim. The church, with its own holding cell, marks the spot where supposedly the Apostle had his head cut off. Pope Gregory I in the 7th century confirmed it so, and coins from the, from the reign of Nero were found here in the 19th century. From the three points where Paul's head bounced, three springs gushed forth. Apart from the assurance of the 4th century Acts of Peter and Paul, convincing evidence of this is provided by three languid fountains, which show precisely where Paul's head touched the ground. Well, not any more. They were closed off in 1950 as a health hazard, but three close altars within the church mark where they were, apparently. Aside from this absurd nonsense, the question to ask is, why traips Paul six miles to cut off his head? The best apology that defenders of the faith can muster is to suggest that a too public execution might have caused a stir. Inmates of the Tullianum, Sejanus, the deposed Praetorian prefect of Tiberius, for example, were killed on the spot, their corpses exposed on the Gemonium stairs or thrown into the forum. So what was so appealing about the area around Aqua Salvia? For one thing, the district was sacred to the ancient fertility goddess Dea Dyer, one of the cults revised by Augustus, and the spring here had a venerable history long before Christianity claimed it as its own. By so doing, yet another bit of Rome's pagan heritage was expropriated by the cult of Christ. Although risible, the story of Paul's bouncing head worked well enough during centuries of ignorance and gullibility, and inspired some fine but misleading art. The body, and presumably head, of Paul was collected by the Christian brethren after his execution and given a respectful burial. Such, at least, is the tradition. Probe the tradition for details, however, and it's all opaque. History is silent, and tradition offers no agreement as to the origin of later veneration. It appears that a Christian woman named Lucina was associated with the burial of Paul in each of three centuries. The Church of Rome began burying its dead in catacombs during the pontificate of Zephyrinus, at a time when the church was acquiring land near Rome. Zephyrinus, as administrator for the Christian catacomb, was a thief and deacon, later Pope Calixtus, or Callistus, who gave his own name to the cemetery on the Appian Way. Here early popes had their tombs, so why not Peter and Paul? This was the period when rival Christian factions contended often violently with each other and the first of the antipopes arose. The problem was that a rival necropolis, also on the Appian Way, also claimed to be the resting place of the Apostles' bones. Apparently, the remains of Peter and Paul had been hidden in the catacombs of St Sebastian during the reign of Vespasian. But then a counterclaim related that the relics of Peter and Paul had been moved to the catacombs of St Pustian only in the 3rd century, in the time of Emperor Valerian. Either way, the catacomb of St Sebastian acquired the aura of a cult site and today has much holy graffiti on its walls to illustrate the centuries of veneration to Peter and Paul. Without saying which of the competing graveyards actually had the holy bones, the Book of the Popes relates the story that the relics of Peter and Paul had remained ad catacumbus until the time of Pope Cornelius, when Paul got shifted to a resting ground on the Via Ostiensis and Peter found himself on the Vatican Hill. But if the bones of Paul reached the Via Ostiensis only in the 3rd century, then what did the tropeum seen by the 2nd century presbyter Caius and reported by Eusebius in the 4th century actually memorialise? Was it constructed soon after the death of Paul or only after the transfer of bones 200 years later? <laughs>
The massive church which stands on the spot is known as St Paul outside the walls and the walls in question are the Aurelian walls built between 271 and 275. The original basilica here was built by Constantine on a graveyard area reputedly owned by a Christian woman named Lucina, she being transferred back from the 3rd century to the 1st. Not to waste a good yarn, it was also Lucina. Now to us forward to the 4th century, who retrieved the body of St Sebastian from a sewer and buried it in the catacomb of Calixtus. Sebastian was also buried in the nearby catacomb that bears his name. The cult site of St Sebastian, the Tropeum of Paul on the road to Ostia and the Tropeum of Peter on the Vatican Hill, may be burial places. Temporary resting places for bones, meeting places of early believers, or simply monuments that celebrate bogus martyrdoms. It could be that the bones of Paul and Peter had been carefully tagged for over 200 years while being moved about before reaching their final destinations. Or it could be that an ambitious church constructed a place of veneration of pilgrimage for its gullible flock, or no bones at all. From beginning to end, the life of the Apostle St Paul is a fantasy, an evangelical adventure reminiscent of a Greek romance, comparable to the tales of Odysseus or Jason. Paul's success is peerless. Wherever the Apostle goes, a few words from the great man convinces pagans and a handful of Jews to convert on the spot to Christ, often along with their entire household. Laced in this remarkable tale of successful salvation is a heart-rending story of personal deprivation and suffering, perils, false brethren, hunger and thirst, cold and nakedness. No fewer than 18 times does Paul survive a fate which would have killed lesser men. Only when the indefatigable crusader reaches Rome does he achieve his goal a death that brings life eternal with his Lord. Even headless, the apostle works a final miracle, spraying his executioner with milk. Not a word of this has any fidelity to historical truth. But having achieved a death in Rome, the real miracle of Paul began, the miracle of imposing a Pauline landscape on a city that had honoured the gods of polytheism for over a millennium. Over the coming centuries, the resourceful mind of religious fraudsters responded with aplomb, creating a Pauline Rome to delight the faithful and instill faith in the doubtful. But it isn't true. It isn't history. It's just more astounding rubbish from the New Testament.